folks, Joseph Isabora here, and I'm doing another movie review this week. This time, it's a science fiction psychological thriller. It's also a drama as well. That came out on January 19, 2001 at the Sundance Film Festival. It later came out as a limited and wide release on October 26, which sadly became a box office flop. But it would soon earn its shares on home video when it was released on March 2002. I'm talking about the cult classic Darnie Darko, which is a story about a delusional teenager who got visited by a strange teenager with a demonic rabbit suit. That was his Halloween costume, by the way. Who winds up having eerie visions of the past and deadly predictions of the future which turn out to be the end of the world. All set on October 1988 in Middlesex, Virginia. Yeah. And this is the 2009 Blu-ray release that um, is a two disc set. In fact it's also the director's cut because the theatrical version is included on one disc and has all the uh, the commentary on for both versions on the back the second disc is just um, the the DVD from the director's cut which I have right here yep that came out in 2004 which is just basically the original film only they added some deleted and alternate scenes that was from the 2002 DVD release. Yeah, which that release alone had uh, some extras that's not included in the Blu ray release that I have right here. And that sucks. It would have been cool if they had put all those extras on the Blu ray release um, and not just the, the 2002 release. Yeah, so that's a shame. In fact, what they should have done for this Blu ray release was they should have added the. Um, the 2002 DVD release as a second disc instead of just the second disc from the director's cut or better yet they should have made a blu-ray as a second disc and put all the extras from both the 2002 release and the 2004 release that's the director's cut and there you have it you have all the extras that they couldn't fit on disc one so that's a shame also, like the last Blu-ray that I got um, at Walmart with, with the fly, this came with it, the, the limited edition card you know, for Halloween. I thought this one looks pretty awesome you know, compared to the Blu-ray cover that I have, but it was worth it. They also have a 10th anniversary edition that includes all four discs, including the digital copy, which is unnecessary. But it's good to own that if you haven't owned the 2002 release. Yeah, and, I, and sadly, I, I haven't owned the 2002 DVD release. And I know, I made a mistake. But I went ahead and picked up the, the director's cut back in 2008. When I, <laughs> when I watched it for the first time after I saw the theatrical version back in 2004. In fact, I heard about this movie from my father. I didn't see it um, when it first came out, but I figured, you know, after he started renting this movie on Netflix, yeah, back when they started releasing lots of DVDs to rent, yeah, before they wound up having a streaming service, that you can still rent DVDs on Netflix, and you can even rent Blu-rays as well. So yes, it started out as just. Um, like Blockbuster and all the other video stores but you get to rent them online so he he's been talking about this film a lot that that both me and my brother Jason who wants up we wound up watching the film we rented it on DVD and I was confused at first when I saw it the first time around but when I saw it the second time, it got better and better. I actually followed the story very well. 
I knew exactly what was going to happen. I didn't. I never even knew it was going to happen, but it had something that that really uh, completely worked because I never even knew that this movie was going to be, as we know it, a time traveling film. I thought it was just going to be a horror film because it even has sort of a horror film element to it in that sort of way, but it isn't really a I mean, I guess mostly from some of those scenes, but it wasn't really horrific at all. I mean, it was just a guy wearing a, a strange uh, bunny suit from Halloween. And it just shows exactly what's going to happen next. And I guess that's what the film was going for, from writer and director Richard Kelly, who later went on to do films like Southland Tales and The Box. Both of which are not very good films. Not at all. I mean, if you love Donnie Darko, then, and you love Richard Kelly as a writer and director, I'm pretty certain you're not going to be impressed by Southland Tales nor The Box. But don't get me wrong, some people do love those movies. I'm not one of them. And I know for, for sure. Because those two films were failures. And even worse, this movie had a direct-to-video sequel called S. Darko, which focuses on Donnie Darko's little sister, Samantha. So this time it focuses on her visions the same way that Donnie Darko had back in 1988. But that film takes place in 1995. And that alone just seems more like another cash-in sequel that was not needed and yeah it, it shows but Donnie Darko has always been a cult classic I never forget it it still uh, became one of my favorite movies of all time it, it did introduce me to a wonderful cast it also has um, a very dark and gritty feel to it and since the movie is set in the late 80's it had a lot of 80's references a lot of pop culture references and an 80s soundtrack that has music from Tears for Fears all the way to uh, Echo and the Bunny Man, The Church and it also features a song which happens to be a cover version of Tears for Fears called Mad World this time it was sung by Gary Jules and I never forgot that song because every time I hear that song on the radio or even in commercials I think of the movie Donnie Darko. Yeah. So let's get right to it. It stars Jake Gyllenhaal along with uh, his sister Maggie, Jenna Malone, Mary McDonnell from Dances with Wolves and Sneakers, Holmes Osborne, Catherine Ross, uh, Dave Lay Chase, um, who went on to do the voice of Lilo in Lilo and Stitch, as well as uh, the main character in Spirited Away, James Duvall, Drew Barrymore, who happens to be the executive producer, Patrick Swayze, sadly no longer with us, but he's been best known for films like Dirty Dancing, R Red Dawn, the original film, along with Roadhouse and Point Break, Noah Weil, from the TV show ER, Bed Grant, Alice Greenwald, Seth Rogen, got a start because he later went on to do comedies. You have Patience Cleveland, Ashley Tisdale, who later became a Disney star, and, and all those others she's been in, Jerry Trainer, and David St. James. It's written and directed by Richard Kelly. The movie begins in Middlesex, Virginia on October 2nd, 1988. We meet a young troubled teenager named Darnie Darko who's played by Jake Gyllenhaal who wants up sleepwalking outside until he was visited by an imaginary man wearing a very strange rabbit suit, yeah, which happens to be a Halloween costume named Frank and he tells them that the world is going to end in 28 days 
6 hours, 42 minutes, and 12 seconds. The next morning, Donnie was woken up in a golf course, and he returns only to discover that a huge jet engine from a plane fell from the sky and crash-landed into his bedroom. His older sister Elizabeth, who's played by Maggie Gyllenhaal, informs him that the FAA investigators do not know where it came from. So Donnie tells his psychotherapist, Dr. Furman, who's played by Catherine Ross, about his continued visits with Frank. But under the influence of him, he floods the entire high school by damaging a water main with an axe, and actually wrote, They Make Me Do It, on the ground right near the statue. He begins to date a new student, Gretchen Ross, who's played by Jenna Malone, who has moved to town with her mother under a new identity to escape from her violent stepfather. Meanwhile, conservative gym teacher Kitty Farmer, who's played by Beth Grant, blames the flooding under the influence of a short story that the structures that was attended by an English teacher named Karen Pomeroy, who's played by Drew Barrymore. He begins teaching attitude lessons taken from a motivated speaker. You know, started uh, doing all these uh, educational videos involving fear and love named Jim Cunningham, who's played by Patrick Swayze. But that alone leads to Donnie by a going against all these motivation lessons all all in between the friction and the problems between Kitty and his mother Rose who's played by Mary McDonald. So then he asks his science teacher Dr. Kenneth Munderdorf who's played by Nora Wilde of what seems to be what Frank brought up the subject about time travel which unfortunately he was given a book called The Philosophy of Time Travel that was written by Roberta Sparrow who's played by Patience Cleveland who happens to be this, the old woman who comes across at her house just to check in her mailbox to see if the mail had arrived. Yeah, in fact, um, she was the one that actually was almost run over by Donnie's father, uh, Eddie, who's played by Holmes Osborne. And, of course, she actually uh, whispers into Donnie's ear about what's going to happen. In fact, she was a former science teacher at the same school. And uh, the book actually explains that time travel is possible when a disruption of the time consumption of the primary universe had occurred. But when it destroys by a fragile tangent universe, that means it could only exist within a few weeks. But by that time, they wound up showing a loophole. At this rate, uh, one of those wormholes that uh, Donnie was experiencing, um, starting where, where he started seeing the, his father having a huge bubble that's popping out, out of his chest. And since then, he started seeing lots of that that's floating around in his wild hallucinations. And it's actually pointing into the right direction into the refrigerator. Yeah, very strange too, but yet amazing special effects on, on that scene alone. Anyway, he's also reading the book about what's going on between chapters after chapters, you know, to see how it, it applies. But then that's where we found out that Furman had told Donnie's parents that he is actually detached from reality which means that all the visions of Frank are from a daylight hallucinations which is actually a sympathetic of paranoid schizophrenia and that alone is what causes Donnie to uh, to act like this so that means that Donnie has to uh, prevent all the future events from occurring you know, before it's too late. So that means he has to stop Cunningham from by actually disrupting a speech only to find out who he really is. 
in his dark secret. So he had to burn his entire house because he knows where he lives. And actually uh, have him caught once uh, the cops have found out uh, who he really is. Yep, and he did. <laughs> Instant karma. But of course, Kitty had to defend um, Cunningham over the controversy that just happened. So he wanted to offer to, um, you know, Rose to, uh, to join in just to fight against it. So, yes. But uh, meanwhile, Donnie and Elizabeth decided to have a Halloween party just after... Um, you know, Samantha happens to be Donnie's uh, little sister, you know, played by Devlay Chase, wants to be signed in for a dance troupe in Los Angeles because he had, which is a, a dance contest for uh, Star Search. So they throw in a Halloween party just to celebrate their acceptance to Harvard for uh, for Elizabeth, and he's also inviting um, her boyfriend to come to the party only to realize that Donnie has only a couple hours until the end of the world erupts so that means um, he has to bring Gretchen who already uh, discovered that her mother disappeared and they decided to join in along with Donnie's friends to uh, go inside Sparrow's house just to find where Frank is going to be and uh, but it only gets worse when the two school bullies named uh, Seth and Ricky, both played by Alex Greenwald and Seth Rogen, so yeah, the assholes, wound up robbing her house before they got caught. And I don't want to give away the suspense or anything like that, but that's what the movie was all about. I mean, about what was it like? If you have a teenager like Donnie Darko who has visions of how to predict the future from happening. Yeah. Meaning that he has uh, an imaginary f man to tell him what's going to happen next. So he has to prevent all of this before everything completely uh, ends already without knowing it. And that's how scary it was. And I like that idea. I mean, yes, it does seem convoluted and confusing as I saw it, but I thought it worked pretty well. Uh, I love the cast and crew, everything from Jake Gyllenhaal, as well as uh, his sister Maggie. I, I thought they were terrific together as a team. You know, they really should start doing movies uh, together more often. But I thought it worked. I mean, you know, Jake is already becoming... Um, a big star after Donnie Darko, already doing films like The Day After Tomorrow, Love and Other Drugs, Source Code, yeah, another film that's similar to that, only, yeah, another time traveling type of film, or what seems to be. And uh, movies like uh, Nightcrawler, which he definitely deserves an Oscar for his performance, in my opinion, and The Watch, yeah, most recently South Paul and Everest. He's very good. Yeah, Maggie, a very attractive actress. Yeah, very sexy too. I mean, she went on to do films like Secretary with uh, James Spader. She even did films like Sherry Baby, uh, Monster House. Yeah, she did the voice of of the main character's uh, sister, older sister, and <laughs> and I know she went on to play Rachel as a replacement to. Uh, Katie Holmes in The Dark Knight. Yeah. yeah, I thought she was good. Better replacement for Katie Holmes. Yeah, it's just sad about what happened to her. Um, everything. I mean, she, she's a great actress. And what's also good that it, it does star um, other stars who um, went on to do some 80s movies. At this rate, we got Drew Barrymore, who was the executive producer of the film from her production company Flower Films. I thought she was very good as the English teacher. Definitely worth it. Yeah, Patrick Swayze, yeah, God rest his soul. I mean, he was such a great actor. It's just sad that they had to have him play him as a, uh, 
a motivated speaker who turns out to be, you know, as we know it, uh, well, I, I don't want to reveal it too much, but you already know who, who the guy was at the end. But it's just kind of depressing to see him now because, you know, he, he's already gone. You know, cancer took him away from him. But he always will be remembered as the actor who was in Dirty Dance Scene, you know, Red Dawn, Roadhouse, Next of Kin, you name it, those movies. And yeah, even Point Break. Yeah, he's a very uh, spiritual actor. I also, uh, yeah, they also had some other actors who later became famous, like Seth Rogen, for instance, you know, who was in the... Already those movies, Super Bad, yeah, the Forty Year Old Version, yeah, uh, Pineapple Express, and then he went on to do other f movies like Monster vs. Aliens, the, the This Is the End, which was my favorite film of 2013. Yeah, now here's another film about the end of the world. <laughs> so that's that's kind of ironic, and then the. He was in that totally forgettable, uh, the interview, which, um, in my opinion, was one of the worst comedies I've ever saw. Yeah, the one that started stupid controversy. And I know he's recently going to be in that new movie with uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt since Fifty Fifty called The Night Before. So hopefully, this will be a lot better than the interview. Let's hope so. Yeah, we'll see. I'm not really looking forward to it, but I'll check it out. Maybe it'll be better. Who knows? But it also has um, Ashley Titsdale, who later became um, a young actress for um, for some Disney Channel movies and all this other stuff. Even that TV show on CW called Hellcats before it got canceled. Yeah. She's a decent actress. And... I do wish she was in uh, some good films, and I know she's she's getting there. But yeah, um, I love all the the shots that they did in the film. It does, like I said before, it had a dark and gritty feel to it. It was definitely the perfect choice. It looked almost like exactly an '80s movie, even though the movie was filmed in early 2000 for its budget of 4.5 million. Hard to believe. So it looked to me like the cinematographer must have been using some uh, some 35 millimeter cheap film stock to make it look more like it came out in the 80s. So it has that feel to it. So why not? <laughs> I love that. And so that's ex that alone. I can explain why the Blu-ray transfer isn't nearly as good um, as I read on on all the websites that claim for it. I don't know. I, I still think it's uh, a decent transfer compared to the previous DVD versions. I mean, it's better than nothing. That's all I could say. Anyway, I also love all the scenes in the film that are so memorable. I mean, who, who couldn't forget the scene where, Don, where Donnie's friends were talking about the TV show The Smurfs? Yes, because we already know about uh, the original character Smurfette on how she was created and I'll tell you this I've seen the episode long before I saw Darnie Darko because I watched the Smurfs when I was a little kid I already knew for the fact that Smurfette was created by Gargamel so <laughs> and I'm glad because when Don when Donnie had to say that now we know that he's smart, <laughs> and he is. Because yeah, I, I love at the end, he's he, the one of Donnie's friends says, "Oh man, why on earth are you make? Oh man, why, why you always have to be so smart with us?" <laughs> oh man. Uh, I also love all this, um, all this funny dialogue uh, when Donnie and. And uh, his sister uh, Elizabeth were, you know, they they were having like a family conversation while they were eating pizza. 
Uh, I remember uh, Donnie actually called Elizabeth a fuck ass. Because <laughs> even though, you know, you know, she's talking about, I'm going to go with the caucus instead of uh, George Bush. Yeah, this is 1988, of course. And I know he, I know he won. And, and she actually says to Donnie, why did you go suck a fuck? And then Samantha says, what's a fuck ass? And then the father was just laughing. Yeah, you could tell he was all cracking up. <laughs> and another scene was when Donnie actually called uh, her mother a bitch. And and then um, his father actually called uh, you know, call Rose, uh, you're bitching, but you're not a bitch. And I never forget that one memorable line in the film was when they went to the Aereo Theater in Santa Monica just to go see uh, the Evil Dead. Donnie and Gretchen were sitting on the roll, you know, watching the film. While Gretchen fell asleep, Donnie actually dreamed and, and spotted uh, Frank uh, sitting right next to them. He was saying, Why are you wearing that stupid bunny suit? And then Frank says, why are you wearing that stupid man suit? <laughs> oh man, I, I thought that was funny. I, I, I love that scene too. It, it definitely shows. Especially when they started showing the, the portal. And then we had a an Asian um, girl. At this rate, she's... I think she's Chinese. Where she actually keeps saying, Shut up! Shut up! She doesn't really talk much other than saying the word shut up. Yeah, you actually do feel sorry for her in the movie because the way she's been treated. And I could tell because she was like um, all around during certain scenes, especially uh, the shot where, where Drew Barrymore's character, um, yeah, Karen, where we find out about what happened. That causes uh, her to to get um, suspended for, from from high school, so she no longer teaches over there. So she has to move to another town. She actually screams, "Fuck!" And then you see her um, right in the corner because you know she knew that she heard the whole thing. Yeah. I, I also feel sorry for Karen, too. I mean, she didn't deserve that. I know. I, I mean, the, let's face it. Kitty Farmer was just a grading gym teacher that I just cannot stand. I swear to God, I could not stand her completely. She was just a bitch. I, I like it in, in the scene where Donnie actually called her, Why don't you just shove this down your anus? I, I, I don't know if he said that right, but I, I guess we already know. If you haven't, if you saw the movie, I don't know. But, I, I, but the way uh, Donnie said it, though, I, I swear to God, I, I, I applaud because she, she really is a fucking bitch. I'm sorry, but that's how I felt. Yeah. Well, but I hated the two guys, though, in the movie. The, the school bullies, especially um, Seth, you know, who was, um, who was about to friend Donnie with a knife, just only to be, only the thought that uh, he was wrongfully accused of having to um, flood the entire school and actually wrote down, they made me do it. Yeah. It also pissed me off because at the end of the movie, uh, I don't want to give that away, but that scene at the end is what is what made me sad. I almost wish that this actually happened to those two bullies. Cause I can't stand them. They're idiots. I feel sorry for um, for Gretchen because of what she was going for. Yeah. What the... Anyway, uh, but I I love the film. Uh, I I love the soundtrack. 
that they chose, all these 80s songs you, that you never forget. Like, um, you know, in, in the director's cut, there was a song, uh, Never Tears Us Apart by In Excess. But in the theatrical version, there was The Killing Moon by Echo and the Bunny Man, as it was heard in the opening sequence. So there's a difference. Plus, the director's cut just added more scenes that were left out in the theatrical version, just so they could make the movie longer and more understandable, you know, for those who, who couldn't understand the theatrical version. Now, don't get me wrong, I love the director's cut. I think it works in several ways. I love all the scenes that they added into it, such as the, uh, the close-ups of the book that could transition into the movie. Yeah, I thought that was cool and clever. I love all the shots of, of uh, Donnie Darko's eye, as you can see it uh, up close. You can see how it starts to change. And you can see some of the, the time traveling movements that's about to, to go really fast after it started speeding up um, backwards um, towards the end of the movie. I, I thought that was cool. But, let's face it, the theatrical version was better. Because it definitely shows what was it like when this was going to happen. And so, I can deal with the deleted scenes as it is, but I'm fine with uh, the way the movie was shot. It was perfect. I mean, it, it was the perfect running time for the movie. I think they just did it so they could make the movie a little longer and more understandable. But that's okay, because I thought it worked. And, yep, I... And that's exactly what they wanted to... I guess that's just what Richard Kelly wanted to come up with. You know? I mean, it's too bad the film didn't do so well at the box office. I think this movie would have earned something if they had. But I guess that's what they're going for. Also, I forgot to mention that... Also, also I forgot to mention that in the soundtrack... Uh, besides The Killing Moon and all that, they have songs like Under the Milky Way by The Church. I really love that song. It makes so well with that scene. The, the song Notorious by Duran Duran during the, the pageant scene with uh, Samantha dancing with her group. I, I also love the song Head Over Heels by Tears for Fears. Of course, that's a good song. I thought it worked so well during the, the high school scene. It almost looked like a music video. Yeah, it almost looked like it was shot like that. And then it even has the piano-driven cover version of Tears for Fears' song, Mad World. That's done by composer Michael Andrews and Gary Jules. Yeah, yeah and, and he definitely does a very good job uh, composing the, the entire score that gives it sort of a a dramatic feel to it. Something you never thought you would hear. Yeah. And that alone became a big hit um, in the UK in 2003 because that would later be because later on after the movie came out before the director's cut was going to be that movie wants up that song alone wants up uh, being the top of the charts and they want up having Airtum play on the radio so that, that was really cool, because now it's being featured in, in commercials and stuff. So, every time I hear that version of Mad World, I think of the movie. And it works. And plus, the movie was shot in Los Angeles. Now, there were some shots uh, where they went to the hotel, the Holiday Inn. That was in Burbank, California, uh, which is now remodeled. Yeah, it was right next to the Suites building. If you had to take the, the long freeway from here, um, there are other shots of the high school that's that's set in uh, Loyola High School in Los Angeles, and all the scenes with the the neighborhood, the whole town. They were shot in Long Beach, and I think the golf course was shot at Griffin Park, or I think that was just, uh, or I think it was Long Beach. Yeah, it was. It was uh, yeah, I think most of it was shot in Long Beach, and other and some sh scenes were probably shot in Griffin Park. Cause I don't know, it looks very familiar when I think about it. 
But either way, I, they did shot it there, and it looks beautiful. I'm trying to give it a Virginia feel to it. But anyway, uh, it. If you haven't seen the movie, check it out. You'll never regret it. I know a lot of fans love this movie, and I agree. <laughs> I'm actually a fan of it, too. And it works. I recommend it. So anyway, I give Darnie Darko five stars. I'm Joseph A. Saboro, and I'll see you later. Bye.